I'm going to go ahead and get started. So the project that I'm using, the source code where I'm starting from is Colt Steel's version 11 deployed from uh, Yelp Camp. And this is from the Web Developer Bootcamp from Udemy. Uh, check the description of this video for links to that course if you don't already have it. And I have an example.env file. It has, uh, this is gonna be following up on the tutorial we did uh, two days ago, I think it was, for Stripe. And the reason I'm doing that is because I don't wanna spend time updating all of the NPM packages and all that stuff. So this is gonna have uh, the stripe keys in here. These are just example keys and then the send grid key. This is also an example key So you want to go and get yourself a key For send grid and put it into your dot EMV file for this to work. And so uh, There's actually over here in this NPM page. There's a link to obtaining an API key so you can get it right here from this link and uh, this link up here is in the description of this video. All right, so SendGrid is free. I think they have like a trial. And even after the trial, they don't charge you, but they, they downgrade how many uh, emails you can send in a day. And so I've actually, my emails have, ex the trial I was using has expired for the account that I'm using. So I have like 500 emails that I can send in one day. That should be fine for what we're doing in this tutorial. Uh, and this tutorial is just gonna be a basic contact form where users can contact the admin of the website. So they'll fill out their name and maybe their email address or their phone number and then a simple text message in a body uh, of a text content element and they'll submit it. It'll send an email to the uh, user. All right, so let's get to it. Uh, yeah, first things first, you're going to want to open up your code editor and open up version 11 deployed. If you don't have version 11 deployed, you can get it from github.com forward slash nax3t forward slash web dev bootcamp. This is not currently in the video description, but I'll put it in there after uh, I'm done making this video. So go to this URL right here. And then once you clone this, you can click clone or download right here. You can download the zip file or you can use git to clone it. Then you can go to Yelp Camp and version deployed is the version that we version 11 deployed is the version that we're using. Mind you, the, the the version we're using is actually an updated version. If you wanted to get the version that I'm using that has uh, the Stripe API code inside of it and some other updates, then you can get it from this repo right here, which is same thing, github.com forward slash nax3t forward slash Yelp camp dash stripe dash payment. I'll also include this link. You can find this one in my recent video as well uh, on YouTube, of course. All right, let's go ahead and get started. This is the running application. Right now, the way it works is if you sign up, The first thing that happens when you sign up is that it asks you to pay. All right, here we go. So this is a new user. It wants you to pay. So we just use this test credit card information right here to make sure that the registration fee of $20 is paid. Again, this is from the tutorial that I did the other day. So if you haven't done that and you want to start from this version, go ahead and check that out. You don't have to. You can start from Colt Steel's version 11 deployed and go from there, it's entirely up to you. Um, I'm just doing it because this version has updated NPM packages and some updated code from some breaking changes and I don't wanna go through all that again in this video. All right, so uh, did I click pay already? Oh, that's annoying. So uh, it's not, my Stripe is not in testing mode so let me fix that real quick. All right, this is our application, and what we want to do is have a page that a user can go to and contact the admin of our website, right? So that would be you, the creator of the website. So what we're going to do is first we're going to create a route that loads that contact page, right? So over here in routes, that would probably go inside of index.js. This is 
all the routes that aren't linked to a resource. So these are all for logging in and then also we have the checkout stuff. So at the very bottom here, right above module.exports, I'm just gonna do a router.get forward slash contact. And since this is mounted on forward slash, which is the root route, this is gonna be whatever the website address is, .com forward slash contact or localhost 3000 forward slash contact if we're working locally. So just put a little comment here, get contact. All right, so the next thing of course is that we want a uh, callback here to deal with this contact. And this, normally I would use like an async function or something, but in this case, I think we're just loading a static page. So this little fancy thing right here, if you didn't already know, is an arrow function. You would recognize it from ES5 syntax if it was written like this. All you do to change it is you just remove the function keyword, go to the other side of the arguments, and do an equal sign and then a greater than sign, and there you have an arrow function. And so then inside of here, we just want to do a res.render, and we're going to render a view called contact. And that should do what we need it to do for now. So then we need that view to exist. Over here inside the views directory, we can right click, create new file, and call it contact.ejs. Now contact.ejs is going to be similar to like the register page here. It's going to have a, a header and a footer. It's also going to have a container with a row uh, and a column. And so we'll go ahead and get close that and we'll just paste it. So we're borrowing this code from views register.egs. Of course, this is the updated code from my Stripe tutorial. So if you're using version 11 deployed, you're going to see something that looks a little bit different. All right, so we don't need all this sign up stuff inside of here. And we don't need this div right here with this link to logging in. This right here is basically include the header. Let me make it a little bit bigger. Uh, we have a container, so then we can have a row. This row is all the text inside of it. It's going to be centered. I don't know that we necessarily need that, so I'm going to remove that for now. And then we have uh, a column that is medium six and it's centered. We do that with call medium offset three, so it puts three and three on either side of six for a total of 12 columns to make a 12 column uh, row. And then inside of it, we're going to include a form with a form group. Gorm form group uh, class and my syntax highlighter is not there we go that was interesting um, I didn't recognize the form tag it's supposed to be Emmett I just started using VS Codium recently so uh, bear with me alright so we have a form with class of form group and then inside of it we're gonna have a couple inputs so like we said before uh, real quick, just someone asked, will this also be available on your YouTube channel? Yes. I'm probably going to edit it first, um, or I'll do two versions. Like, I'm going to upload another version of the Stripe one that's a little bit better quality and a little bit shorter. And the same thing for this one. We'll probably do an upload that is, you know, cuts out some of the stuff. If you're coming back to watch it later, you don't need to necessarily watch me try to figure out my API keys and all that stuff. So, yes, it will be available at some point in the near future, possibly as early as tonight and there might be multiple versions uh, the first version being the long version and then the second version being the edited version okay so back to the code inside of the form we want to have a label and I'm typically too lazy to do the the four blah blah thing so we'll just do a label with an input nested inside of it and that's how you draw the relation between those two and so then the label will be something like uh, name and we can just duplicate this maybe three times and so the next one will be uh, let's just do email so then change that type equals text to email uh, type equals email and then the last one will be message so this isn't going to be an input this one be a text area uh, we don't necessarily need the ID and the rows and stuff. We just, just leave it there for now. It's fine. Um, okay, so 
these need names the first two the last one already has a name so the name will be name and then email so it'll be rec.by.name rec.by.email and then message rec.by.message this one doesn't need an ID we do need a way to be able to submit the form of course so we'll just do an input with type equals submit class is equal to button button um, what is it button primary yeah that's fine by the way the syntax I'm using here is bootstrap if you're not already familiar with it this particular project uses bootstrap 3 I do have a tutorial here on YouTube where I convert bootstrap 3 to bootstrap 4 for the specific web app uh, Yelp camp so feel free to convert this to bootstrap 4 whenever you're done with the tutorial uh, because it's using bootstrap 3 already I'm just gonna keep it with that syntax alright so these inputs need classes so we'll go ahead and throw the class of I think it's form control and that should do it alright and then these top two can have four slashes at the end if you want since they're self-closing um, I think that's right alright so this might actually just work just by going to forward slash contact. There it is. It's not super nice looking, but that's a form. Uh, the submit could be on its own line. I'm trying to think what the easiest way. I mean, obviously, just putting a line break would be easiest, but um, there's better ways to do it. But anyway, just for the sake of brevity, go ahead and just throw a line break in there. All right, again, name and email. Um, technically, everything would be on the same line, but because I have a column six, they don't fit on the same line. So if you want, you can throw line breaks in here. Typically, line breaks are used, you know what? Let's just do it the right way. So typically, line breaks are in HTML are used in text. Like if you have a paragraph and you physically need a break in the text, then that's why you would use a line break. Um, wow, something crazy happened here with the formatting. Oh, this is going to drive me crazy. Alright, so I've got a couple line breaks in here. I'm going to go ahead and get rid of them and replace them with divs. And somehow that div got on the wrong. There we go. No. All right, that's how it should look. Great. And then this would go over. Wrap this one in a div. Coding is all about patience, which I don't always have, fortunately. Because a lot of coding, especially web programming, is just like monotonous, boring stuff like <laughs> this right here. And annoying too. It's like there's got to be a better way. And there is. If you if you're like super familiar with stuff like Emmet, you can write the markup really quickly. Um, but either way, all right. So I guess snippets make that kind of thing easier. So these are all inside divs. Let's go ahead and do one last div for the button here. Refresh. There we go. Isn't that nice looking? Great. All right. So the user is going to enter their name, their email, and the message that they want to send the admin, and then they're going to submit. And it's either going to work or it's not going to work, and then it's going to send uh, them back to the home page with a flash message. Or it might just refresh this page. That's fine, too. And it'll tell them, hey, your email was sent. Uh, thanks for your email. Or it'll say something like, you know, your email didn't send, and here's why. All right, so next order of business is to handle the sending of this email. Well, right now, our form just has a class and instead it also needs an action so that's the route that we're going to submit the form to so let's submit it to contact that's fine but instead of a get request which is the default for a form we're going to use method is equal to post in all caps and so if we go back over to routes index.js now we can just duplicate that Say that it's the post version, change it to router.post, and this is going to use some async code. So we'll say put the async keyword before it, 
And so now we have an async function that can use what's called async await. Uh, I described how to do it in my last video, but don't worry, I'll, I'll go over it again. Just know that you've got this arrow function here, which we talked about a second ago, and now we're making it an async function that allows us to use the async await keywords with promises. All right, great. So let's jump back over into Chrome and head over to the NPM package for SendGrid Mail. And so the URL for that is npmjs.com forward slash package forward slash, uh, what do they call that, at sign, uh, send grid forward slash mail, or you can just look up at send grid forward slash mail. All right, so it gives you the prerequisites. You need node version six, seven, or eight. Um, that node is way newer than that now. I think it's all the way up to like 12 or something. Uh, so just any of those versions should be fine. Just something six or newer. And then obtain your key. So go get your key from this link right here. You might have to sign up. And then set up your environment variables. So once you, uh, the, they're calling it SendGrid API key. They're showing you how to export it. I actually use .env. So what you would do if you're doing the version like I am is you go to example.env, you put in your SendGrid key. I called mine SendGrid underscore secret key. They call theirs API key. Uh, so I'll go ahead and update it just to be the same as how they have it. And then real quick off screen, I need to go uh, change the other one, the real one. Okay, and we're back. All right, so it's gonna look like this, sendgrid underscore API key is equal to, and then this is the key, obviously not the real key. Yours is gonna look much longer than that that you're going to get from your SendGrid dashboard. So it's under the developer section, API keys. Uh, so yeah, once you have that, then of course you'll save uh, the .env file. It's not gonna be called example.env, you're gonna remove the word example. And then you're gonna make sure that you have uh, .env installed. I have it installed as a dev dependency. The command for that is npmi-d.env and you run that in your terminal if you don't have it installed. If you do, or it's already in here, but you need to install it, just run npm install or npmi for short. Okay, so with that out of the way, uh, over in app.js at the very top, make sure you have that require.env.config before anything else. And that'll make sure that your app, the entire application, all the backend files have access to the values from these keys. You can access them via process.env dot and then whatever the key is. So we'll show you more of that here in a little bit. So that's that step for setting up your environment variables. Now installing the package is next. npm i dash dash save uh, at SendGrid mail. Short version is, let me just open this up real quick. npm i dash capital S. I don't even think, if you have an npm version newer than like five, whatever, five something or other, uh, you don't even need the dash capital S. What that does though is it saves the package into your package JSON. Newer versions, like I said, version 5.11 or something like that, and newer of npm, all you have to do is npm i at sendgrid dash mail. Uh, okay, so with that installed, we can even double check on it, package JSON. There it is, version 701. So quick start, hello email. The following is the minimum needed code to send a simple email. Use this example and modify the to and from variables. For more complex use cases, please see usecases.md. All right, so there's a lot of stuff you can do with email, and we're not gonna get into all of it. We're just doing a simple contact form. Typically, if you are on a busy server and you're sending emails, then you wanna use like background jobs. That's definitely a tutorial I'll do in the future. But for now, we're just gonna send it directly from the route, so it's gonna happen on the same process as the HTTP node process. And that's fine. It should do what we need it to do, at least in testing and local development, and probably for most use cases with low traffic on say like a Heroku server, if you're just showing it to employers. If you plan on having a website that actually like dishes out a ton of emails every day, which if you have something like that, good for you. Uh, 
then you'd want to use background jobs, which would require a worker on its own process. That's not something we're going to cover in today's tutorial because it's pretty involved, but it is a really cool thing to learn and know, especially with Node.js programming, and so I will do that in future tutorials. So uh, stick around if you want to see that kind of thing in the future. Make sure that you subscribe with notifications. All right, so this is the example here. First things first, they want you to set a variable equal to SG mail and require SendGrid mail. So we're going to do that over in our routes index.js file up at the very top. And we'll do it right below where we have our Stripe set up. So we'll say require SendGrid uh, forward slash mail. And then you have to set your API key. So that'd be the next line. And again, const, if you're seeing the const keyword for the first time, it's really simple. It just, it's basically stands for constant. It's a variable that is constant. It does not change. You cannot reassign it to something else. There's some other really cool things about it. Colt Steele has a video on his YouTube that covers it. I think Fun Fun Function and several other YouTubers have videos about it as well. But for uh, the sake of what we're doing right now, just know that it replaces the var keyword. This is newer syntax, so you should learn how to use const. Uh, there's another one called let that you would use in other instances. Basically, the rule of thumb is if the variable does not need to be overwritten or reassigned at any point in the program, then use const. If it needs to be reassigned, then use let. There are some other little tidbits that you should learn about them, but that's like the general overview. Okay, so what we do is we assign a variable equal to the at sendgrid forward slash mail uh, npm package. And then we set the API key for that. That set API key is just a method that comes with this object right here. And then we pass in the API key. Now this is what you have inside your .env file. We covered this a second ago when we talked about the example.env. You just remove the word example, install .env, make sure that you get your API key plugged in there, get it sent over from uh, the SendGrid dashboard whenever you get signed up and you should be good to go. All right, so the next code is creating the message and then they have two versions. They have ES6 and then they have ES8 which uses an async. Uh, this is a immediately, uh, what is it, an, an if here or whatever, immediately invoking function expression. So it's a function expression, it's just an anonymous function that's wrapped in parentheses that gets invoked immediately after being uh, written. So the other version is ES6 where they use dot send dot then and they're just using dot then. So we have a, a async await which is what I like to use and then we have a dot then which is the thenable promise. Either one is totally fine but you don't need to use both of them. So first let's get the message sorted out. So if we head over to our code and we go down here to the very bottom where we have post uh, forward slash contact we paste this in and what we get is const message, so we have a variable named msg or message for short, equal to an object literal that has a couple properties on here to who we're sending it to, from who it's from, subject, whatever the subject is, text, the text is just basic plain text for your email or the alternate HTML option which is what most email uh, services like Gmail and Hotmail and Yahoo or whatever uh, they all use HTML so you want to fill both of these out because not everybody uses HTML and they may revert to the text version alright so to get this information uh, to send it to we're gonna send it to uh, learn to code info at gmail.com so this would be your email this is where it's getting sent to now from to get where it's coming from, we want to pass in the rec.body.email. So this is the email that's coming from our form. So over there in contact DJS, we have this email right here, type of email. That's where it's coming from. So from rec.body.email, this is the email of the person who is filling this out. By the way, in contact.ejs, it's probably not a bad idea to make all these things required. Great. So back over in index.js, the routes file, routes index.js. The next is the subject. You can hard code the subject if you want to. 
So you could say something like, and this would make it to where you can filter these emails in your inbox. That way you know which emails are spam and which emails are coming from your contact form. So you could just say Yelp Camp, uh, I wouldn't say customer because these aren't, well I guess now that we have the Stripe thing there are potentially customers. But anyway, we'll just say Yelp, Yelp Camp contact form. Uh, and then so the text, this is the content that comes from rec.body.message. So if we go back and look at contact.ejs, we have name is equal to message. This is a text area. So that is where that's coming from. And then the HTML, uh, you could potentially convert it into HTML if you want to, but it's not entirely necessary. Um, so here, for the sake of brevity, we're just going to put rec.by.message. But just know that if you want to, you could do something like this. Like you could wrap it in strong tags, and you probably wouldn't want the spacing there. Um, and then what I'm using here with the back ticks and then the dollar sign and then the object syntax, this is template literal syntax. Uh, it's the newer, faster way of doing string concatenation. And so if you're coming from a language like Python or Ruby, you've already seen this kind of thing before. But uh, this is new, not, it's not new, but it's from the more recent versions of JavaScript. If you're coming from Colt's course, you wouldn't have seen this uh, in the Web Developer Bootcamp. Okay, so the equivalent of that, by the way, would be like a string, strong, and then plus rec.body.message, and then plus another string, strong, which is fine. In this case, uh, it doesn't look that much different. It looks just about as easy. But when you're typing out entire emails and you actually are using a lot more than just like one single HTML uh, tag, then it can end up getting very complicated to use concatenation. It's a lot easier to use this template literal syntax. Just remember when you use the template literal syntax, anything inside of the dollar sign, open curly bracket, close curly bracket, is a JavaScript expression. So if you have a variable, you can plug it in there. If you wanted to do one plus one, you can plug it in there. And then this string has to use back ticks. It can't use double quotes, it can't use single quotes. It has to use back ticks in order to use this, the template literal syntax. All right, so we're just going to make it use uh, the variable itself. And that's it for the message. Now, people can enter uh, some harmful stuff into a form that could potentially be malicious for your application. So you'd want to do what's called sanitization. Uh, Colt doesn't do that in Yelp Camp. I think he does it in the um, the blog app. So if I can remember, I'll go back and do that before the end of the tutorial. But for now, let's just go ahead and get these emails sent and um, get that part of it working. Okay, so we're going to skip down past the ES6 syntax and we're going to go to ES8, which is this uh, what's called an iffy, immediately invoked functional expression, and it uses async await. And so the the reason they have the, the iffy here is because without an async function, the await keyword won't work. Well, fortunately for us, our function is this callback right here, this middleware. So when someone sends a post request to forward slash contact, the very first and last, the only, uh, function that we invoke is this async function. So what we can do is we can just borrow this try catch syntax here, everything inside of the async function, and put it inside of our own async function that has access to the rec and res variables there. So right beneath where we have const message, we're just going to plug that in. Try catch is a really great way to be able to catch errors. So any async code we have, like this send grid or sgmail.send, this is asynchronous. And so we're waiting for it to finish before we do something, like redirect with a flash message. But in the event that something bad happens, like an error happens during this transmission, it'll get caught in this nice little catch block. So if you haven't seen try catch, this is what it looks like. It's try and then open close brackets and then catch error inside of parentheses, open close brackets, and then you deal with the error. Great, so we can console.log the error 
if there's error.response, we can console.log error response body. Okay, that's good. We'll just leave that how it is. Uh, the other thing we want to do, of course, is notify the user that something went wrong. So we'll just do a rec.flash error. So mind you, these this code right here where we're logging, that's specific to the developer. That's going to help us, but the user is not going to be able to see it. And so we do a flash message, rec.flash error. And we don't have to show them the error message because we don't know exactly what it's going to say. So we don't know if it's something that really would even make sense to the viewer or the user. So we'll just say something like, uh, sorry, something went wrong. Please contact. Well, <laughs> I guess you can't really contact the admin. Um, but let's just for the sake of, um, you can't use the contact form, but we can just put the email directly in here. So we can say, please contact admin at uh, our website.com or website.com. So we put the email in here. This would only happen if there's an error, letting the user know, like, hey, that didn't work. If you, you please notify us via an email from like you'd actually have to go and open up Gmail and send us the email. All right, so then we can redirect. So in this case, we're just going to redirect back. And the redirect back is actually, <coughs> excuse me. Yeah, that's fine. We'll just leave it like that. So this other thing here, await sendgrid mail or sgmail dot send and then message. We're passing in this message. <coughs> excuse me, message variable. Once that's done, this is the beauty of async await, right? We have this async keyword for this function right here. <coughs> I might have to go get a glass of water here in a second. Uh, for this function, and what it allows us to do is use the await keyword. And what this does is normally sendgrid.mail would take either a error first callback. So if we didn't have the await keyword, it would look something like this, comma, function, error and then you would handle the error here you'd say okay if there was an error then we know there was an error do something with the error otherwise there was no error so we can do a flash message uh, you know flash success and redirect so that's nice and everything but that's the old way with callbacks and if you're familiar with callbacks and you already know that using callbacks can get you in what's called callback hell where you have like the callback Christmas tree and it's just, it gets kind of messy. It's hard to keep up with. So we have this new beautiful way of using async await. But first, let's talk about the step in between, which is venable promises. And so async await is built on top of promises. It's just a nice way to write what looks like synchronous code, code that happens one after the other. Um, but it's the technology behind the scenes is promises. So with the promise, you wouldn't have the callback like that what you would have instead is you'd have your sgmail.send and then you'd have a dot then which would have the result if there is one and so this is the success so you'd handle the success there and then you could also um, use a dot catch chain it onto the dot then so we have dot send dot then dot catch and the dot catch is similar to the catch that we have here where if we end up having an error then we handle it well we're able to bundle that up and well it's, it's done for us but it gets bundled up and we get to use async await which is even prettier so without all this dot then with the callback inside of it, and if you wanted to, of course, you could turn this into an arrow function to make it a little more elegant. But without all that, what we end up with is just plug the await keyword in front of send gmail .send message, and nothing else after it will get run until this is done running or until it throws an error and gets caught inside of our catch block, which is really great because Sometimes in our code, we don't want to redirect until whatever it is is done doing whatever it needs to do. So in this case, we don't want to redirect and let the user know like it worked or didn't work until we know for sure whether it did or didn't work. 
So in this case, if it gets to the next line, we know it worked. Otherwise, if it threw an error, it would skip the next line and go straight to the catch block, and we would handle it here. All right, so when we're on the next line, we can assume success has occurred and the email has been sent. So at this point, we can do a rec.flash success, and then we can say something like, thank you for your email. Um, we will get back to you shortly, something like that. And then on the next line, we want to do a rec. Oops, sorry, res. Redirect, and in this case, we can just redirect back to where we came from, uh, or if you want to, you could redirect to forward slash, which is the home page, uh, or if you wanted to be uh, explicit about where you want to go instead of saying back you just say take me back to the contact page whatever's clever so we'll go ahead and save that and I think at this point if everything is working properly then we should be able to give this a quick test so in the meantime let me open up my mail client so that I can receive the email if it does end up working and then we can test this out Okay, so I've got my email open in another window. Whenever I get the email, I'll, I'll switch over to it. And uh, oh, that was interesting with that octatree. That's cool. Okay, here's our Yelp Camp application. We can refresh, and this page actually is available to anybody. There's there's no um, middleware that says you have to be logged in to go here. Uh, it's not connected to a logged in user or anything like that. So a guest can go here and send an email. Couple issues with that, of course, uh, you could get spammed. So you probably want to set up a couple things. You probably want to put it is logged in, so the user has to be logged in. At which point, if you want to, you just pull their name and email directly from their user account, and you can skip that all together and just have a message. Uh, the other thing is that you probably want, even if you have the user log in, you probably want to do reCAPTCHA. Uh, I don't even know what version they're on now, but Google reCAPTCHA is good for mitigating most, if not all, bot attacks. And last thing you want is for your mail server to get shut down because you get a bunch of spam emails from bots. So those are things to consider. Um, just to do like a baseline defense, what we'll do is go back over here to our get route and right after uh, forward slash contact, the string, we'll say is logged in comma and now if we refresh this page after the server restarts it says you need to be logged in to do that okay fine so then I log in and this setup currently is actually pretty sweet because the only people that can see that uh, can log in and go anywhere are people that have paid right so the other thing we could put in here is is paid So we're basically saying like, you can't use the contact form until you're signed up and you've paid for an account. And so I'll show you that in a second. This, again, of course, is built on top of the, why is my server, I must not have the is paid middleware inside here. I think, you know what, it doesn't even matter. Um, I'm just gonna take it out rather than pulling that middleware in. Because if you think about it, the user doesn't like if the user signs up but they haven't paid yet and they still want to contact you, they should be able to if they have a problem. Uh, so let's make the contact form not available to guests, available to people that logged in but maybe are still uh, in that pending status where they haven't paid yet. Great. So at this point, you try to go, let's just go to the home page. We're not logged in. You go to forward slash contact, which of course, how are you going to know that that's there? So let's put it up in the uh, uh, whatever you call that thing, nav bar. All right, so views, 
partials header.ejs. If there's no current user, then give them login and register. Otherwise, give them uh, these two signed in and log out. So it doesn't matter if you're logged in or not logged in, you should be able to use the contact page uh, because it'll tell you to log in if you're not logged in. So we'll put it before these if else EJS syntax here. And it's just a li with an anchor tag, forward slash contact, and it goes before these. And so this is inside the navbar nav, navbar right, inside of header EJS, which is inside of views partials. Let's test that out and see what happens. And there's the button, contact. So you click on contact, it says you need to be logged in to do that. We log in and it redirects us to the campgrounds page. So now we click on contact again, which if you wanted, you could have it take you back to contact. Uh, that's kind of outside this particular tutorial. I can do that for tutorial in the future. If you want, comment in the live chat and let me know if you want that or just comment in the video if this is the recorded version that you're watching at a later date. Uh, let me know if you want the feature where when you visit somewhere and it says you're not logged in, go back to login. Once you log in, it should take you back to where you were previously. It's fairly simple, but I don't want to take up too much time with this specific tutorial, so I'm not going to do it right now. Great, so we're back at contact. We're logged in. You can see I'm signed in as Ian up here in the top right corner. I'll go ahead and put my name anyway. Ian, and then email um, learn to code info at gmail.com. And then the message is, hello world, this is a test of an email, exclamation. All right, so then we submit it. And it says, thank you for your email. We will get back to you shortly. That's the flash message for success. It worked, great. And so I'm gonna run over to my email real quick and see if it actually sent. And hopefully it comes in quickly. Sometimes it takes a second. So just bear with me. Also, let me make sure I put the right email in there. Learn to code info at gmail.com. All right, so while we're waiting for that, what I want to test out is what happens when it doesn't work. And so the only way to do that would be to just throw a, uh, what do they call it? They call it a throw. I think it's throw new error, uh, something went wrong. I mean, you could put whatever you want right here. That's just the message. So if this part works, which I assume it will, then it'll get caught by the error block. That would be the same as if the sendgrid.mail.send method was to actually throw an error, at which point it would get caught. So what we're hoping to see is a error, sorry something went wrong, please contact admin at website.com. So then we'll just refresh this page. It logged me out because the server restarted. And so I'll go back to the contact. Ian, learn to code info, gmail.com. This is a test, submit, boom. It caught the air, it said, sorry, something went wrong, please contact admin at website.com. Okay, great, so that part worked. I can get rid of this throw new error line here and save. I am not seeing this email yet, which tells me uh, something's going on. So what I'm gonna do, oh, it might be in my spam, hold on. I didn't think about that. Yep. Hmm. <laughs> Glad I checked. Okay. So if you're doing this tutorial, make sure you check your spam. In this case, Gmail was like, this is probably spam. It's coming. It's funny because it's using your same email in this case, just because I sent it to myself and I said it's coming from me. But it's you can see this little text right here via sendgrid.net. And so it's actually not really coming from me. And so uh, Gmail is like, that's suspicious. I'm throwing it in spam. This is not spam. If you're gonna be using your SendGrid account for legitimate email sending and you do see stuff in spam, make sure that you report that it's not spam so that Gmail will learn, there's all kinds of crazy stuff in here, uh, that 
it is not spam. And so now we have this thing here. It says display images below. Uh, let me see what that is all about. Oh, there are no images. That's weird. Okay, so hello world. This is a test of an email. And then you can see the title here, Yelp Camp Contact Form. And that was three minutes ago. So it worked. Um, yeah, that's it pretty much. The other thing, of course, is the sanitization. Thank you for uh, a couple people reminding me about that. Let me go ahead and get that added in. So in order to do that, I'm going to run over to GitHub, Web Dev Bootcamp, and just take a quick look at, I think it's under RESTful Routing, RESTful Blog App, App.js, Express Sanitizer. So this is the name of the package, Express-Sanitizer. And let's just go ahead and look up Express Sanitizer NPM, just to make sure that we're using the most up-to-date thing. So here's the first one, Express-Sanitizer. And it looks like it's properly maintained and everything. So let's go ahead and install it. So the command that I just copied was npm install dash dash save express sanitizer. Like I said before, if you're using the newest version of npm, you don't have to use dash dash save, but yeah, it's fine either way. The shortcut, of course, is dash capital S. But either way, one way or another, get it installed. 1.0.5 is what they're giving me. And usage is to bring it into your application. Mount the middleware below express.json or prior to express uh, 4.16 would be body parser and above mounting any of your routes. Okay, cool. So in, oh, that's interesting, my phone. For some reason thinks I'm trying to talk to Google. Okay, so inside of app.js, let's head over there real quick. We can bring it in right after cdb. And so we can remove the const keyword. Just make sure you put a comma after cdb, require seeds. Uh, this may be commented out if you're not using seeds or whatever. Either way, plug it in here so you're requiring express sanitizer. And then we're gonna go ahead and save it. The next thing they want you to do is put it below either express JSON if you're using the newest versions of um, express or if you're using a version prior to 4.16, you'd be using body parser. So I think I'm actually using a newer version, 4.17.1, I believe, which is the newest version of version four, but I think I'm still using express.bodyparser. So I'm gonna go down and see what I've got. Yeah, so I have express.json, here we go, app.use express.json, and then app.use express.url encoded extended true. So beneath this, but before you mount your routes is where they want you to put app.use express sanitizer. So anywhere after these lines, and if you're not, if these, if you don't have these, if for whatever reason you're still using body parser, then make sure that you change it to express. Just make sure that you're using the newer version of express. For me, I'm using 4.17.1. So yeah, down here before you mount your routes, so we have our routes being mounted with app.use, you're going to want to plug in uh, this line, app.use express sanitizer. And so I'll do it right after app.use flash. So app.use express capital S sanitizer, and then you invoke it, make sure you invoke it. And that's from this variable that we just pulled in right here from the express sanitizer package that we installed. Save the file. Now we can use rec.sanitize for each of the individual properties inside of the post route. So we'll take this example right here. And basically what it's gonna do here is if someone creates a script, they're going to remove not just the script, but everything inside of it too. And so this is a basic implementation of what's called the Kaja HTML sanitizer, or Kaja, however you wanna pronounce it with the specific purpose of mitigating against persistence XSS risks. And so 
you'll want to look at some of this stuff here if you want to go into further detail I'm not going to go into it but you can even check out what all the Kaha HTML sanitizer entails by going to this link right here which will take you to their github page you can go down here and see what all I can do for you all right cool so what we want to do is go into routes.js and or sorry routes index.js and before we create this message right here we want to sanitize the email and the message and so what we can do here if you say const sanitize string is equal to rec.sanitize rec.body.property.sanitize uh, property to sanitize that the first one would be email and so what we can do let's see here we can say something like let and then use this object syntax and use uh, object destructuring we can say name comma email comma message is equal to rec.body and what this will do is it'll look at the rec.body object that has a name property has an email property and has a message property and it'll assign each one of those properties to the corresponding variable name here that we have inside of this open close bracket syntax and so if you haven't seen this before this is called object destructuring look it up if you haven't seen it before but it's exactly what I'm showing you you can use the let or const keyword in this case we'll use let because we're gonna reassign them so we say let open close curly brackets this is on the left side of the equal sign and then we say name email and message because we know that rec.body has a name email and message property and so then we have these variables now name email and message and we can sanitize them so we can say name is equal to rec.sanitize and then just pass in name and so that's basically what's happening here for the example we'll just get rid of that line duplicate this twice change name on the second one to email and then change name on the third one to message now it's with the email it's probably not going to let people send emails or send anything other than an email because that's how the uh, form is set up it's an input type is equal to email but here's the thing this is all front-end stuff so someone can go in here and they say okay this says name name or name email so I'm going to send I, what they'll do is they can just go I can just show you what they'll do <laughs> instead of just talking about it um, anyways the point is we need to sanitize this stuff so then down here inside of message instead of rec.body.email we're just gonna do from email and then text message and then HTML message now we never did use name right and so we could do it right here in the subject let's take the single quotes and let's change them to back ticks so we'll say Yelp camp contact form from and then dollar sign open close curly brackets name and so it's Yelp camp contact form submission from and then whoever the person's name is all right cool so this is what it should look like now let destructuring syntax name email message equal to rec dot body and then sanitize name is equal to rec dot sanitize name email is equal to rec dot sanitize email message is equal to rec dot sanitize message const message open close curly bracket object literal syntax to your email from their email that we sanitized subject with the person's name inside of it using template literal syntax text and HTML with the message that's been sanitized great so if we save this we can go back and test it now I'm just gonna move my email off screen for a second and let's try this again so I'll refresh the page you must be logged in because it logged me out I'll just log in with my user real quick go to the contact form name uh, we'll just do Ian again that's fine I was trying to think of something clever but I didn't oh by the way what I was gonna tell you about a second ago is this is how the form looks but anybody that knows anything about coding can go in here and say well instead of uh, an input type of email I want to change this to input type of text oh and instead of it being required I want it not to be required and you know you can just keep changing it they could even change they could create a whole new element that is a text area and then give it the same name of email so all that stuff can be changed on the front end and 
that could become problematic. So we'll leave it how it was. Ah, uh, just refresh the page, what the heck. All right, so if you try to submit it, it says, hey, fill out this field. So you put your name, submit, it says fill out this field. And then if you start typing, you'll say, oh, by the way, you need an at sign so that you this can be a real email. So you put your email in there. And then for the message, hello world, this is our second email test. Please work. All right, so we submit, we wait half a second. Thank you for your email, we will get back to you shortly. Awesome, so let me just run over to my email client real quick. And right away I just got the email. All right, so Gmail is telling me, hey, be careful with this message. This may be a spoofed message. The message claims to have been sent from your account, but Gmail couldn't verify the actual source. And that's just because I use the same email from the to as from the from. And like I said before, it's actually from sendgrid.net. It's from your sendgrid account. And so it's not spam. It looks safe. It's fine. We know what happened. It's not suspicious. All right, great. So here it is. Hello world. This is our second email test. Please work. And if you want, you can start testing out. Um, here we go. Yelp camp contact form submission from Ian. That's uh, the email to the same email. That's why we got that uh, little alert. And then here's the message of the email. And if you want, you can go to the HTML section here and you can really trick this stuff out. Like you can use the uh, open close curly braces. You can inject the message. You can use H1 and say, um, hi there, this email is from, and then you can inject the name, and then you can you, know, you have the message on the next line, and, and maybe you make it, uh, I don't know, a paragraph. And so depending on how much data is coming from your form, you could really create something kind of crazy here. And so if you just want to test it one more time to see that in action, move the email out of the way, refresh, log in again, and this will be the last test we're going to do, and then uh, that'll be the end of the tutorial. And you guys will have to remind me about the other stuff that I said I would do because I'll probably forget. Uh, okay, so in future videos, not in this video. Learn to code info at gmail.com. And you could actually put anything you want in here. Obviously, you would want to put an email that the admin could click reply and actually respond to you with. Uh, there are APIs for checking the validity of an email, by the way. So the ideal situation, just food for thought, is that if we're making sure that users are logged in before they can contact you, even if they haven't paid with the Stripe feature yet, because some of you may not even uh, implement the Stripe feature, you want to have a user email tied to the account. Right, so in this case we have username and password, and then I think we have a property called is paid if you're using the Stripe feature. But what you could do is you could add an email property, which is a string. The user would have to add an email when they sign up. You would send them a verification email. They wouldn't be able to use anything in their account. They could pay if they want to, but they wouldn't be able to do anything else until they have verified that the email is legit. So they'd have to go to their email client, get the email that you sent them. Now you know how to send emails. Get that email and they would click a link. That link would take them to a page, a route on your site. They would use a token that's embedded in the URL to verify that that account has that token on it. It would then change the property of something like is active from Boolean value false to true. And now you know that that's a legitimate email that that person can receive emails on. And so at that point, you don't even need the email here in the contact form. You just have them put their name, or not even that, you could just have them put the message and then you could pull the rest of the information, the username or the name or the email from the user account that's sending this message. So that's above and beyond what we're doing in today's tutorial. We've already gone for quite a bit. So uh, just something to think about for future tutorials or just something that you could try on your own. All right, so for this message, last one, hello world. This is our final test for now. And uh, just for the heck of it, let's put a script in here and say, alert, is this thing on? And then also, let's put some HTML tags in here. So let's say strong, uh, big, bold text. 
strong. Make sure I type that correctly. Okay, so we will submit it. It says that it got sent. Let me go check my email real quick. And yeah, within like half a second, I got the email. So let me bring this over here again. It's telling us that same thing. Uh, so we're going to say, okay, this looks safe. Hi there, this email is from Ian. Hello world, this is our final test for now. Big bold test. Uh, so let's go review that. There's the H1. So this would be an H1. Did I forget to? <laughs> so the reason the whole thing's an H1 is because I forgot to put the closing H1 tag. And you guys probably saw that. So guess what? It's not our final message. We're sending another one. So let's test that out real quick. <laughs> it's ridiculous. It does work, but let's just make sure that uh, I'm an idiot. All right, contact Ian, learn to code info, gmail.com. Uh, don't send emails to that email, by the way. I'll, I'll never see them. Uh, message, this is a test script, script, uh, H3, hello world, H3. All right, so this these bottom two, actually, this one should still be there. This one should get rid of, be gotten rid of. Uh, let's see what happens. Submit. It says it should show up in my inbox here in a second. It's refresh. There it is. And pull it over. And there you have it. The H1, right? That's what we put here. And then the paragraph. Well, this whole thing is a paragraph technically for the message, but we put an H3 in there. And so you could use a WYSIWYG, which is what you see is what you get, a uh, rich text editor, anything like that, tiny MCE, medium editor, markdown editors, whatever you want, and you can input nice syntax for sending the email. You don't have to do anything that fancy. I'm just saying there's possibilities, endless possibilities, right? Uh, someone asked real quick over in the chat, uh, do we have to sanitize all of our forms? It's a really good idea. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I would. Any data that's going to go into, you know, any data that's going to get potentially executed or potentially put on the front end or uh, interact with the database, anything like that. Uh, you want to guard against XSS attacks. You want to guard against uh, SQL injection, all that kind of stuff. So sanitization is uh, very helpful. You definitely don't want people to be able to somehow input a malicious script that would mess up your front end or mess up your database or anything like that so sanitization is definitely a good thing uh, yeah so this email looks safe that's it Yelp cam contact form submission from Ian thanks for hanging out um, really appreciate it uh, don't forget to subscribe and, and like and share and all those things that are very helpful for the channel and uh, everyone stay safe out there thanks a lot and we'll catch you next